Right, how are we on? Yeah, that sounds pretty decent. Everybody, is that too loud? Too? You sure? Okay. Just seems really loud to me. Apparently, I have the great blinking screen up here, so. Where's my mouse? There it is. Right over here? There we go. Why are you blinking off? Stop. What's my resolution? Do you know what the... Okay. We're going to try that. Nope. Okay. 12 by 8. Does anybody remember where they hid display mirroring in KDE? Okay. Yep. I'm, I'm <laughs> I agree, it should be, but... Um, Found it. Meta P. If, assuming it works. It just tried to take my native resolution instead of its native resolution. Yeah, that's just my water bottle. Success, almost all the success. That works enough. Are you done licking? Technical problems, right? I yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not too worried about that. It's more like I'm getting part of the screen, but not all of it, which is okay. It's mirrored. Yeah. Okay, so on the stream, you do actually stay the whole desktop, or you just. Okay. Because. Good. Yeah, they're mirrored, so they should be. Interesting. Is that going to be in the right? Okay, it looks okay from that perspective. <sighs> okay, let's try and actually get this started. At least this time the technical problems don't seem to be my demos yet. You know. Okay, despite some technical difficulties, we're going to get started. We have roughly three hours of space to cover a whole lot of information. What I'm going to start with is if you're already an intermediate in Kubernetes, you're probably ahead of the game. If you are an int intermediate who doesn't quite understand how it works under the hood, you're probably still interested in what's going on here. If you want to know the specials of how software-defined networking works in global cloud resilient infrastructures, wrong course. Okay? If you want to know how I do magic storage things, wrong course, I'm not covering that part. This is how does it work, what is it from the ground up. We're going to cover what Kubernetes is, why it exists, and some practical real world patterns for you to actually get experience with it. This is not, hey, look at my demo. This is not, hey, watch my video for 10 minutes and I get my views and you get to wonder what in the world all the magic does. This is, this is the tech that actually makes the thing work. Let's demystify the building blocks so that you actually understand what you're using so that when you go to apply yourself to it, you can actually learn as you're doing it instead of going, okay, now I have more questions, now I have more questions, now I have more questions all the time. So let's start with the part one, which is what the heck is this? Right. By definition, you can go and read what it actually says it is. Their definition is very straightforward. It's portable, extensible, blah, 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 blah. Here's the thing. What is a workload? How do I make it work? Where do I make it work? And why do I do that? I want to be able to do this in declarative fashion, and I want to be able to do it full of automation. Right. So in English, we keep track of what you told it to keep track of. Where to put it? If it dies, how to restart it. If it should restart it, shut it down when it's not needed. If you're getting rid of those applications, automatically get rid of everything that, that, applica that application was using unless you told it to keep it around. Kubernetes just spends its time actually wiring up all this software definition of storage and networking and runtime and resources, and it makes it so that you don't have to care about it in detail. 
You declare it, you ask for it, so long as it's got it, it'll hand it to you. When you take that workload away, unless you tell it to keep it, it's going to just remove it and hand it to something else. Or in the future, when you have auto-scaling enabled, it will just return them to the wider clouds pool rather than holding onto it itself. So people ask, okay, why do, I, why do we see K8S? Honestly, people got tired of saying the whole name and they got tired of typing the whole name. So we got an acronym and they jaded and went, look, there's eight characters in between. Ta-da! Now we have what Kate's is. That'll come up later in an interesting way. But it's really that straightforward. So that's the quick pitch of what it is. Congratulations, I've described a system of orchestration. But what the heck does that actually mean? Let's look at the evolution of how workloads have existed. You have a machine. You have your operating system, and then you have your services that you've defined and where they're stored and how they get to things. Right? This was us in which decade? Every decade. Okay, that's where you start no matter who you are. Then you get into virtual machines. Okay, now we have much bigger machines with all of these resources, but we don't really want to have a hundred different applications having to co-locate and fight over who gets port 80 and who gets port 8089 and da 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 da. So we start using virtual machines, breaking these things down, isolating our workloads. But now we have complexity starting to come into play, right? And who's run a dozen virtual machines? Okay, how many of those virtual machines were using all of their resources? Yeah, a whole lot of not sures, right? The, the short answer is not a lot of them. Okay, so then we go from we're doing VMs so we can use more resources to this isn't very efficient. Let's try to cram more stuff in. That's where we get into containers. Right now you've got this thing that looks like it's by itself, but is really sharing with everybody else. And this thing, and this thing, and this thing. So now we end up with the hardware and the OS and then the runtime instead of the hypervisor. And if you're doing it in the cloud, then technically you're on the hardware with the OS that has a hypervisor that is running virtual machines that then has an OS that then has the runtime that... Software, right? Turtles. All the way down. So, um... Yeah, but why? Right? You had those monolithic single purpose machines. You have mainframes, right? Go back to an AS400 that was in use in the late 80s. They just did the thing. They managed services. There was a bunch of people that could use them at the same time, but that's all they were. And of course, we're like, okay, if we're gonna spend a million dollars on a machine, we better be getting our money's worth. Seems simple. Overhead, 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 right? Like I just described a few minutes ago. How many times do you want to deal with overhead? How do you get things to be more efficient when people are going, this costs too much? Just like every person in IT, when the system works, that's great, why am I paying you? When this is broke, why isn't it fixed yet? Why am I paying you, right? This is the way it works in hardware in the real world. Whether you're an application developer or an SRE, in the end, you want to get more for your money no matter what that resource is, whether it's money or time or anything else, you want to get to that one. So we tried all of these fund managements, but now we get to the problems that are complicated about having many things sharing resources, right? We've got great virtual machines. We've got ways to take a virtual machine from one location to another location. We know we can move it from here to there. We know this one's got 16 gigs, this one's got 32 gigs. We've got to take out the 32 gig. How do we move it across a half dozen 16 gigs so nobody falls over while we do it? And so this process and problem began. Then we start looking at these containers, right? And I'm, I'm going to air quote this because who here thinks that a container is basically just a small VM? <laughs> Hopefully nobody. It's complicated. It kind of is, but not in the same way. So we'll get into the details of how a container actually functions in a little bit. 
But what we care about is we're orchestrating containers now when we used to be orchestrating virtual machines. So let's look at it from how this stuff actually works, right? You effectively have a controller and you have its API, you have its UI or UX, the user interfaces, and you have the command lines to interface with that one. Behind that are all the things that are actually going to be doing the work. So you have your controller, you have your workers, and then have wherever your containers are stored, wherever they're going to access storage. From an infrastructure perspective, instead of a design perspective, you have, here's my nodes, here's my workers, Here's my applications on top of all that. At the bottom, we're talking about the straight up head nodes. That's the control plane. This is the thing that actually controls where things are. Each node is actually responsible for managing itself and its workloads while they're active. And then your developers and users don't care because they don't have to worry about that because that's the SRE's job. Those applications don't have to care what's underneath of them or aren't supposed to have to. So. Why go to something that complicated by looking at it as compared to just Docker Run or Compose or the many other variations that have come along? Well, has anybody ever tried to manually run 15 interconnected services in Docker across a, I don't know, 100 machines? How about two machines? Right? Even one machine, it can be a problem if you're doing it just with Docker itself. Right? You know, it does work, but how do you do this in scaled configuration? It's, it's a problem. And even then, once you have a half dozen or a full dozen, now you're just staring at it like this is a problem. Okay, so look at something like Docker Compose. Now you can actually define a complete workload. I need a database, and here's my web server, and my files are here, and my configuration gets mounted here, and these two can talk to each other, but not that one, and only inbound. You can get a little fancier, and this handles some of that complexity for you. But Docker Compose works on one system, which means your scale is still one system. You can't do that as you grow. There's going to come a point when all of that in a single system is going to be a problem. Well, especially if you're running a data center and you've got, you know, 15 racks of 30 servers a piece and you're going to do this on every single one of them and then cross connect them all. Okay. There are tools out there that do make container orchestration a little easier to do beyond Docker Compose that are meant for many systems. Rancher is one of those. And now I'm referring to like Rancher 1.0. Rancher 2.0 is a little bit different. Um, Portainer is actually a pretty nice GUI interface that allows you to configure a bunch of your containers, manage the versions, and control some of this stuff. Remotely, no less, so you don't have to do it all from the CLI. However, they still end up with this problem of the underlying what are they built on top of and why is it hard to maintain. It still comes down to this problem. How do you do this at scale and resiliently? Where are your images? How are they stored? How fast can you replace a node? How fast is your network? What talks to what? How does it talk to what? How does it know to talk to what? And then, of course, storage. Which disk? Where? How? If you're storing all of your data on the machine where the container is running, and that machine goes away, what happens? Did you plan for it? Do you know? Do you know how? If you didn't, you're going to find out the hard way. And trust me, that's not really fun if you have anything you cared about. So then, quote unquote, there was Kubernetes. Mm, it took a while. Does anybody know what Kubernetes, the original origin of Kubernetes was? Got a hand in the back. Borg. No, not the backup software. Borg still exists, believe it or not. It came from inside of Google. However, there are some serious drawbacks that that has compared to what we have available to us in Kubernetes today. That said, most of those were 
you needed to know a whole lot about how the system worked. You had to understand the APIs, the hows, the whys, the design patterns. It was very complicated. It still is very complicated, extremely resilient, great at scaling, but at a cost of complexity and the context you have to have mentally to make it all work. So there's not really a way to get that to be adopted if it's so hard to approach, right? And then you, you have, where's the network layer? They, they built a container orchestration platform and it had no concept of managing the network. So you still had to manage your container interconnects by hand. Ow. Not only that, your applications now had to be aware of the system they were within. So there's no make a Docker container, build it on my machine, try it in Docker, and then put it into a, a workload and then ship it to the cloud in Kubernetes. Didn't work that way. Well, as a result, despite it being called Borg, it didn't really assimilate. It's so much as it had to change the way it worked. The adoption took a while, and the microservice capability and cloud native application deployments Many things have come along, and the differences from Borg are starting to show themselves. Least of which is removing the need to explicitly convert applications to the runtime environment and the systems that it was actually working with. Refactoring like that is expensive. If anybody's ever had to do an application that had to be aware of its environment that much, and then went, hmm, that's complicated, because you don't realize how much your application depends on its environment until you have to change it. Kubernetes is, is built to be more approachable than Borg significantly. They changed out some of the underlying technologies for ease of use. It's more reliable without requiring all of the information and the automation helps significantly with that. And it's made with the explicit intent to tame the complexity of managing these cloud native applications and their entire application lifecycle. Now, the question is how did it succeed? How did it win? Right? So, how many people recognize Kubernetes just because it says Kubernetes? Is it a buzzword or is it something you've tried? Yes, that is a question to the audience. I'm seeing a couple of nods, kind of a couple of shakes. Okay, we got a mixed bag. It being open source meant, of course, that there were many things to compete against. It didn't just come out of nowhere. A bunch of people got together. They decided on paths forward. It was adopted slowly by the community. And it's older than you think. Anybody know how old Kubernetes actually is now? You got one person in the back that got it right instantly. Yep, it's, it's now 10 years old. Five years ago, people didn't know what it was. <laughs> okay. It, it's kind of getting up there. It's aged and it's matured a lot. In the end, the biggest thing is the reduction of the complex work into simple and direct idioms and being able to do it in those in a declarative pattern and not have to worry about that. Yeah, I'm not going to call it real simple but I'm gonna to try to explain it to you simply today. It's very much like chess. Getting the basics, super simple. Getting it right and being very good at it, eh, it takes some time, that takes some experience, and hopefully not too many lumps. But we all have to start somewhere. So here we are. So what is it actually made of? How does it function under the hood? You're gonna hear a lot of C's and they're all gonna have an I. You have the container something, X, Y, Z. Remember those pain points we talked about? How do you do the networking? How do you do the storage? Which container runtime are you using? Where's my... You have the container runtime interface. This can be container D, which is the default now. This could be Docker. This could be Rocket, App C. I, I can just keep doing that. The API is consistent. If you talk to it this way, you'll get this pattern out the other side. 
networking interface. How do you actually do the software? You say, I need an IP address that's on the box, or I need an IP address that's addressable in my namespace, or I need an IP address that's fake. I need something that people can talk to, and then it will get one of my 15 pods. CSI, your storage interface. Where's your disks? There's many options for those, but I'm only covering the main ones that we're going to care about. The runtime, the networking, and the storage. There are several others. Okay. But how do we actually do that? Right? Needless to say, there's many options out there in different implementations. Just like Linux, there are many flavors, many distributions, and even flavors of within those distributions. There's your provider ones. You've got EKS, which is Amazon's GKE. Linode has their LKE. DigitalOcean has one. Everybody at this point is kind of having one. And then you can run your own. Rancher has RKE, which is part of Rancher 2, and K3S, which is one of the things I'll be using for part of the demos today. The Ubuntu community believes in microcates. And then there's also many community SIGs. One of those is Kind, which is short for Kubernetes in Docker. And another one is Minikube. Uh, if you can run Docker, you can run Kind without a problem. If you're running on a platform that doesn't do great at running Docker natively, Minikube can be pretty good at that. Even if you just want to isolate your resources, Minikube will manage a VM for you and then stand everything up in a happy fashion. There are differences. Because remember what I said, C something I? Those are all interchangeable. So the preferred defaults can be different. So there's little changes in mix and matches. So even though they behave for you mostly the same, they can be slightly different under the hood. They vary by what they have included, what the defaults are. We're going to skim over most of these. Important parts are how do you automate actually standing some of these things up. Now, I'm not going to cover that today. But I'll take a mention of a couple of projects that are out there, which is COPS, Coop Spray. And if you're using Amazon for whatever reason, EKS Control is amazingly your friend. For small-scale infrastructure, I have a project out there uh, called Buzzcrate. And you can effectively stand up a full Ansible setup for one, two, four nodes, whether they're the $180 unit I'm running this presentation on, or a couple of ARM boards, or larger. You'd be surprised how easy it actually is if you take the time to walk through the building blocks that are involved. And people go, oh, well, it's expensive. You've got to have a server. You've got to pay for... No, you don't. Remember I just mentioned those self-hosted ones and the many variations that we have? Well, after all, it is open source, right? So as long as you can technically operate and you have the resources, that's the important part. And the thing is, for as resource intensive as the platform provider versions can be, because I can tell you right now, GKE still consumes about two gigs on the box no matter what if it's just living. But you can trim that down a lot. And there's a number of great tools that already exist for that purpose. You don't have to have a giant Epic server. You just don't. I mean, you can do that. And I do that for my company. We have uh, many very large ones. You don't need to. What can you use for hardware? I mean, literally, hardware. You can use an old desktop. This presentation, the whole demo, is on a Skylake. It's got RAM. It's got an NVMe. You can use a VM, too. Do you get your desktop that's got 16 gigs of RAM? Give eight of it to a VM you can play with. When you're not using it, shut it off. Blow it up. Doesn't matter. Use containers. You've already got a machine somewhere that can run containers, right? Well, we talked about Kind. K3S also has K3D, which is their K3S in a container. 
yes, it is a little confusing when you say that you're using container orchestration by using containers to orchestrate contain. Yeah, we can go deeper if we want to. Um, how about, nah. The fun part is when we say newer, cheap hardware, I can talk about old hard hardware all I want. You can go buy a machine that's basically got nothing in it. You don't need a GPU. You need something that's got an iGPU, and some CPU cores, and some RAM, and the storage. And you can fiddle with it. So why not? Now, I did bring toys. However, I'm using it for the deploy. <laughs> I'm using it right now. So this is where I get a, a break from the slides. Does anybody have any outstanding questions they want to try and get to over the course of today? Preferably in non-advanced questions. I might be able to answer those from time to time, but that won't be materially what we're targeting. Oh, I would also put in a plug, if you want to try Kubernetes on your desktop, you can use Rancher Desktop, which is a really nice way to do that. Uh, yes, Rancher Desktop as an example. I have, I have a Mac for work, and I use Rancher Desktop. And it, Rancher Desktop on an Apple Mac does support using Rosetta, and it, so it actually is pretty effective at solving the problem of dealing with the emulation layers. Okay. Well, we're, we're 30 minutes in. Anybody want to take a quick break? Figure out anything? If you guys want to me to put the sources material back up. I can do that real quick. Can get you the sources to the slides, but I was meant the sources list.
Right. So f for the sake of the stream, the, the question was, like, what would be a good example case to take a container workload and then use in Kubernetes to, to show the benefits of it? Um, that one's a fun one because it really depends on, like, what applications you're familiar with and whether they'll somehow benefit from the scaling and resiliency patterns. Um, it, like, just a basic web server it will allow you to show what it's like to have it scale and be able to literally take one out and have nothing even notice. Um, if it comes to like a file server, don't do that. <laughs> um, Kubernetes is, is not awesome at stateful workloads. It's not bad. It's a lot better than it was five years ago. It's a whole lot better than it was two years ago. Um, but it really is like, what do you want when it comes down to it? Uh, you can run a unify Wi-Fi controller in it. It works just fine. And you run a Redis over here, and you run this over there, and then you run the application code here. Um, the application code, of course, you'd only have really have one unified server, and then its data would be elsewhere. So you could just demonstrate how to describe things as that complete workload, and then you have data resiliency, and you have application resiliency. So if the server goes out, it just automatically goes, hmm, something wrong, down, up. Uh, while your data sits over there and is happy. And if the data goes out, it'll bring that back up as fast as it can. And you can just literally watch it come around. Mind you, Unify doesn't handle my data went away very well. It's not graceful about it. Um, but honestly, no server is happy when its database goes, it just stares at you and goes, uh. Most of them will fail and then try to restart. Uh, but that actually also gives you an example case of if the database does go away, when it does fail, it will automatically get restarted. So it kind of is like, what do you want to pick to poke at? And then how do I pl apply the paradigms in a way that is useful? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I, I've seen a lot of Hello Worlds, and I can walk you through the Hello World. Like, um, my coworkers and I have a, an internal training that's that's literally the children's book for Kubernetes. <laughs> like, these are what the workloads are. This is what a workload actually is. What this is what's inside of a workload. This is makes up its requirements. And da 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 da. Um, they they literally have children's books. Like, they do, and it's it's cute. Um, but they are actually effective if you look past the, the facade that's been put onto it. And those are basically hello worlds. Uh, we actually do that as part of our internal training of explaining to people how these things function um, to actually walk them through. This is a pod. Okay, now get rid of the pod. Now make it a deployment. Now you have three. Now get rid of that. And then how you access randomly which one it goes to. How do you update content? Like We show them how it functions through many, many stages. Um, I can't use that internal training, <laughs> unfortunately. Uh, but I can basically explain it. Yeah. And that, that's the slide set that I'm actually mad that reveal eight. <laughs> what? Well, it, technically, it's not reveal eight. The hacker slides container eight. <laughs> I don't know how many people I've lost for the day or are just at the restroom break. So, Still trying to figure out why my display is flickering and that one's not. Kernel says everything is fine. Okay.
Yeah, it's, it's doing this weird flickering. There it goes. Yeah, no, I, I finally got them to match up. <laughs> so now my resolution is that resolution. Yeah, because that's, that's doing 60 hertz. This is doing 60 hertz. So they're matched. So hopefully that weird flickering will go away, but we'll see. I'm definitely sad about losing my slides. But that'll cut a half hour out. <laughs> I don't think I'm going to have a whole lot of problems with time today, which is a good sign. Shall we go ahead and take a shot at getting started? I gave everybody about 10-ish minutes. And this is where I also hope that my slides are in the right order again, because I had them numbered by session, but, well, we'll find out. No. Okay. Yeah, that container ate more slides. Great. All right. I don't know. I have a bottle here. It's just tucked under. Um, Apologies for this face as I'm, I'm, I'm realizing that like I'm very annoyed with having lost content right now. <laughs> All right. So this section is intended to demonstrate actually build, use, and, and deploy of containers. Um, the intents here are using Docker, which we should all have an idea of what Docker is by this time. How many people are familiar with a tool called Dive? Anybody? Cool, that's gonna be a fun one for you to learn from. Um, Hadolint, anybody have any idea what Hadolint is? You got one nod, okay, good. You'd be surprised how few people know what Hadolint is. Scopio. Okay, we got, eh, got, a, you got a handshake. So, Scopio, in summary, is, it's a, uh, effectively a tool for actually interacting with container registries and operating on containers locally. So in, instead of having to do a Docker pull to find out metadata from an image, Docker itself doesn't have the things like DNF repo query. Scopio implements those APIs in the CLI. So you can actually say, Scopio inspect remote image and it will ask the API for the manifest data. You don't have to pull it down to be able to do Docker inspect. So you can look at it and be like, hmm, that's four gigs. Maybe I don't want that container. Docker Compose, we're gonna use that as an example of just how to stand up a complex application and why this is a problem at scale. Like I said, I'm missing content because where you see four slides, there's supposed to be seven. Oh. Okay, first things first, we're gonna make that bigger.
That looks better, right? All right, so first things first. Do I do oh, good? Docker is running. The obvious thing, right? Docker images, what's all the things I have? Classic, how to use Docker. Everybody's already familiar. Can I, can I skip? This is how you Docker run. Yeah, cool. So, who here can actually explain to me what Docker run does? Got one in the back to, yeah, but what, what does it do? How does it do it? Not just, okay, it runs containers. Got one in the back. Take a shot. And I'll, I'll, I will repeat it for the stream, but take a shot. sounds in an image too and typically you use it with dash 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 rm for and for a small container that's automatically removed mostly uh, the part the mic didn't catch up was when you do docker run the first thing it's going to do is i don't have that image and then go pull it if it needs to or attempt to so docker run actually goes what was i told to do what am i supposed to do with it do i have the assets to do the thing go attempt to do that. Um, but at the way it does it, we'll cover in further details. And I like the fact that you actually called it out namespaces because namespaces and C groups are things that we're going to cover and how they actually work. Because you can understand how to make containers, but if you don't know how containers work, and I mean actually work, then none of that actually matters because you're just throwing tarballs at the wall. So, I have a running container, right? First thing I'm going to do is, this is the one that's running my slides, this hacker slides. I'm going to run dive. What's in my container? Where did it come from? I can tell you everything that's in the container. I can tell you where it came from. So dive is handy because you can look at it in order of the layers. And here's the part of what we're going to look at again later is what's, what is a layer? It's a run command or a copy command or a, no, not quite. But it's how people see it because of the way Docker files are presenting it. So in this particular case, you see from blobs, this is actually, uh, looks like an Alpine container for a base. I'm going to remove all the unmodified files. And then all we have here is it copying and a content for app. Right? That's just all it is when adding a layer. And here they then copy in the content of the application. That's all it is. It's literally take my base, take my file system, and then slap stuff over top. That's all you see. Now, if I looked at the Docker file for this, I'll bet you there's more because it tells it how to start and what to do and, and further things from that. But I can go from here and I can look at, this is actually the layers SHA down here. So every single one of your layers is a tarball of some kind. It could be a compressed squash fest for some run times. It can be a tarball for most. Every single one has a SHA-256, it has identification. Every single container has a SHA-256. Every single container that is finalized and built has a SHA-256. You're going to see SHAs basically GUIDs everywhere. I can look at these down the line. I can come at the bottom and I can say, okay, how efficient is this thing? This efficiency score is um, idiomatic. It's not perfect, but it will give you a baseline to operate from. It's fun, though. Because you can go searching for what you want 
in a larger container. I picked this one because this is the one I'm currently running. If I were to pull an application container, like my actual application container, this isn't fetching right now, by the way. It's just a really big container. It takes a while to process. Now, this isn't going to have three layers. It's not going to be 44 megs. It's kind of like a gig and a half. Come on, little guy. This is where the skylight shows its uh, length in the tooth. There we go. <laughs> now it looks like it's dead simple, right? Here's some layers, here's some stuff. Copy stuff in. Well, first thing we do is do an update. We do some scripting changes. We copy in a couple of files. We can't see it very well because I've got to shrink the size down a little bit so you can see the number of layers this has. This is no three or four layers, is it? Um, you can't see it on the screen anymore because it's too far away. 2.1 gigs for that image. Now, not every application is that big. I know why it's that big. And my developers know why I don't like that it's that big. But image efficiency, where am I at? Pretty close, right? 99 is not bad, even for being idiomatic. Potentially wasting about 3.8 megs out of 2.1 gigs. Not the world's easiest thing to do. It's not complex, though. It's just mildly tedious. Now, if I come down to a very busy file, it's data dir. I'm looking for a layer that I know is busier. I'm tabbing around, so I apologize while I try and work with not being able to see what layer I'm on because of the screen resolution. Yep. That'll work. Legible again? There we go. If you have a container, every single time you touch the file system, every single time, you're going to end up with a change. What you see here in highlighted, I've removed all of the unmodified files, directories, etc. If you change permissions, that's touching a file. If you touch the content, it's touching a file. Anything in any way touches a file, new layer content. The orange ones are something was modified about it. The green ones are these are new files. This is literally just installing a couple of things and their packages and the things they brought with them. I can sit here and keep holding page down if you'd like. You get the idea? Every time you do anything, including a DNF update, you will touch your file system. So when we're talking about the efficiency, we're talking about the perspectives of how you build the images and what the impact of your changes are. Okay. So do I need to sit here and walk through actually what a Docker file is for folks? Because, I, again, I apologize, I'm missing slides that were there last time. I can write a Docker file from scratch. Yeah? 
Uh huh. Sort of. Sort of. The question from the audience was, is it possible to have a Docker, a Docker container and then have it spit out the Docker file that was used? What is the tool that does that? The, the layer metadata is actually there. Um, some of it is actually anonymized because there are things that are there. But you do need to keep in mind that if somebody is using a technique called a multi-stage build, you'll only see with a final layer. So case in point, This is the base image that all of my other application containers actually work in. What you're going to see is you have a bunch of from, because people are, are used to seeing from, whether it's from Debian, from Alpine, from scratch, right? What you're not necessarily accustomed to is doing many, many froms using an as statement and then having a final one that has from something. The last from is all the extracted Docker file content is going to show. It will only show from that down. And anything that is in an arg is actually only present and available during the build. So you'll see env exposed as environment, but arg can be used as environment inside the Docker file, but you have no idea what their value is. So I have separate containers that pull and verify several components that we consume, but then I don't have to do that in every Docker file that needs it. I do it once, I pull it as an asset, and then I just keep pulling it in. Because then I can go do whatever I need in my final layer, which in this case is actually set a default lang variable. You'd be surprised how many containers do not have an actual language config, so they rely on Whatever. Um, and if you've never had to fight with my UTF is not configured correctly, just do that. Like, seriously. I install the bare minimums in this container. Yes, sure. Is that better? Okay. It's okay, because I think I can sanely get it. Uh, this copy here, when you run a copy, you're copying essentially files from somewhere. By default, when you run a copy, it's copying from your working directory inward. But you can copy from other containers. This is where I'm talking about the multi-stage. Right? You have your a Docker file that is literally top to bottom, I'm only ever one behavior. A multi-stage build is actually doing many, many things and then coalescing them at the end. This can actually be very helpful because you can have a dev container that still has all of the libraries and the symbols, but you can have a production one that actually strips all of that out. So your production containers end up being smaller, but when a dev needs to test something, you can deploy the dev for one second, pull all the symbols at the runtime, and then switch back. But by doing it this way, I don't have all those additional run steps of go, download it, check it, verify it, and then fail. I know that this, through my CI, will only run once this gomplet is available to me. And then I can just set the environment variables in my entry point, and then everything that inherits from this image inherits all of the patterns set forth for this image. This is the, I'll get to this in a second. Question in the back. I do not have, 
I can try. Does that help? I apologize, I don't have the slides off hand for this. Like I said, I lost content, so I'm doing this somewhat from memory. I apologize. So this container is actually GitLab base plus our Ruby stuff, and now we're actually installing all of the Rails code and its runtime and its, its behaviors. Notice the gigantic pile of froms. I don't need to be compiling my assets all the time. So in some cases, I don't even pull that in and I compile it myself. In many other cases, I just pull the pre-compiled assets because I can save 20 minutes. There's a layer I don't have, but my final image will just see copy assets. Same thing for multiple tools, binaries along the way. Then we get to our final one, what you can see is as base. Now I'm going to be doing copying. All those things in, I need Rust for something. We have multi-platform support in the work. And we get to the last from, all the way down here. Where are we at? Yep. Now mind you, this is how large the Docker file is as an example. The final from is on line 198 to 279. About 90 lines of a Docker file if you were to extract it. That's one third of this file is actually the final image. And a lot of it is literally setting environment variables for the runtime. Now, the, the reason I do this, the reason that you should consider doing this if you have any application that's complex or has a large number of dependencies, is do you know how many things would come into the image and back out of the image? And for anybody who's going to ask, no, doing DNF uninstall at the end of the Docker file in a run command does not remove it from the image. It's in there. It's big. It's fat. It's giant because you didn't clean up your layers. Remember when I said if you touch a file, it's a change file? And a tarball or whatever it is you're shipping is every single run command? If you run DNF update and then you run install, and then you do run make, and then run make install. That's a layer, that's a layer, that's a layer, that's a layer, that's a layer. The reason you see quote unquote run on run statements is because they're condensing a number of things into a single layer. If I did that RMRF at the bottom, one command later, I shipped that content repeatedly. If I were to install something, then remove it. Let's say I go up and I install all my build dependencies. If I don't remove them, either by using a multi-stage build, therefore they're never there, or uninstall them in the same layer, I just shipped the entire GCC toolchain. My application doesn't use it. It doesn't look like it's there. It's hidden, thanks to the magic of the file systems, but I shipped it. Do you have a reason to ship 500 megs that you don't use? No. It's about having effective. Now, sorry, my brain is very annoyed. I don't have my slide content. <laughs> I'm trying to work past that. This is, this is probably the largest and most overcomplicated example that I could give you, but it was something I could get like that and pull into my slides. Okay, so the question was, was why would you end up shipping 
GCC if you didn't do a cleanup? And to that end, why does Docker ship them all in those layers? Docker does not build in a shroot. Okay, so Docker file is effectively a way to automate a bunch of steps. If you wanted to say build a change root or a Actually, most people know what a change root is, right? Anybody not familiar with how to build one and how to run one? Okay. The, the short answer is if you're building out a change root, you're effectively bootstrapping a folder on the file system. Docker is not doing that. So if you were to use dbootstrap to actually build like a new image or uh, do a change root, from a live boot so that you could fix your operating system. Docker doesn't operate on a file system and then ship the file system. Every line, every command, every run, copy, etc., is a new layer in the container because it executes that command and then snapshots. That's why you can't just do it here and then take it out later because they're not operating in one contiguous file system every single time is a new snapshot of the file system and any changes that have been made to it. That's intentional and part of the original design. If you want to, you can, by the way, very easily go the dirty route and build a change route and then copy the change route into the container. That's how you ship exactly that little tiny bit. If you've if you know everything that you need is there, you can literally just take it and slap it in the container. It's just raw copy. That's a fun one. Okay. So the question in the back was uh, about understanding why Docker does it in this way and how it's dealing with tarballs versus compressed assets. Um, where is the mic? I apologize. Can you repeat that? Because I don't want to do you injustice. Um, I was just thinking that it, it would be significantly more f more efficient if if Docker just squeezed away all of the, its containers into single images that were downloaded and then and then hard linked everything based upon hashing. Uh, well, when uh, after you finish downloading the image and then you use something like DwarfS instead of tarballs uh, for mounting it for mounting the image compressed. So here's the fun part, and that's I'm going to touch a little bit of the next section. That behavior is intentional, and they do actually compress it. And you can compress those layers in multiple ways. So it's a tar ball, but technically different runtimes. So CRI, like we're talking about Docker here, but you can actually have those layers be squash FS. And then you stack the squash FS with the same kinds of file system drivers. The trick is. People go, oh, why, why not ship the entire container? What if you had a container that inherited from another container? Um, let's, let's say that you're building off of the Golang official containers. Yeah. Well, well, the only advantage of building off of another container is primarily size, and that, and that if you have multiple containers which all inherit from the same container, then, th then you deduplicate the base image. But because so many containers well, remove and add files, that, that significantly reduce that efficiency. So I would think you could achieve something even better if you just hard linked all of the same files that are shared between multiple different containers in your system. You also have to understand that you're making an assumption that, that is actually the same file. This gets tricky because not every system operating has the same behaviors for hard links and not every file system that the runtime is using actually supports hard linking. So very complex question. I can answer that in much more detail, but it, we're a little ahead of ourselves. Yeah. <laughs> uh, storage is cheap. It's not cheap when you need fast storage or when you need to send it over the network. Um, but 
The short answer is the layers are that way so that you can inherit and share. And by doing them in smaller amounts, if people are efficient when they're building those layers, then you actually benefit significantly. Yes, they, they definitely can be collapsed. And that comes to another point of efficiency that we can get to. Yeah. Um, of, co of course, you can do from scratch and then copy everything from the previous thing. But that kind of defeats all of the, well, all of the te other technologies of d Docker. And you lose all the air benefits. But yeah. So that's a, f a separate fun discussion. The, the short answer is, yeah, taking what you're done with finalizing and dumping it over scratch not always your best choice. There are many approaches for optimization, and that is one. It's rarely the best choice. I'm just saying that's an option you can do, right? right. Where was I? I don't remember. Actually, that was probably a good file. Is how to lint running properly? No, not on that one. The next tool I was going to get to was how to lint. But I got to figure out which file is going to make how to lint the least happy. Yeah, sure, perfect example. Anybody familiar with shell check or other linters? A couple of, okay. So how to lint is effectively just built on the sh shoulders of those things. It's a little more context aware. It understands what's going on in terms of, of Docker. In this particular case, it's going, hey, you know you can just use a work door. This command literally does that, as opposed to CDing around in your directories. So it dislikes this line. Because the first thing I do is CD. Now, is it wrong? No. Is it perfect? No. I can also just take how to lint as an example. And it can tell me all kinds of interesting things. Like, remember when I went and did the RMRF on the directories? It's going to tell you, remember to get rid of those list files whenever you do an install. They're best practice helpers. They're not perfect guidelines. Uh, anybody not been in the industry for a decade? Good. Okay. I was going to say, uh, some of you, God love you, but you're young. Okay. I want you to remember something because I have an opportunity in some of the, the old hats in the house. If it's standard practice, that doesn't mean it's best practice. Uh, and if it's best practice, that means that it's best according to known standards. Sometimes best practices don't apply. So even if you have a linter, even if you have a happy tool, even if you're using AI, don't trust it. Read it yourself. Know your context. Otherwise, you're going to make the same mistake the guy on Stack Overflow did. Okay? The, the usefulness of this is it will catch you doing accidental mistakes that can affect you in ways that you didn't expect. Like, there's literally in their example, use work dir instead of CD. If you're working inside of that directory, you can just use work dir, especially if you're just doing the little thing in what you're doing. The Docker file that it complained to me about has evolved over time. And we probably could go back and revisit it and clean up a little technical debt. And that warning is not wrong. I'm not doing any, anything except working in that. So I'm not CDing here and then CDing there and then CDing there. Worked or would have worked. 
I have other images where I'm doing something in this directory, and then this directory, and then this directory, and then workdir wouldn't have made sense, because workdir is a directive that sets the default working directory for every future call. So in this particular case, it's not wrong, it's not right either, right? I don't think I've actually seen somebody try to do expose port 80,000 before. It's a finger slip. It's not that hard, right? Now, the nice part is, you know, we're looking at it this way, and you can install it like this is running the, the open source port of code. You can install the extension and integrate Hadalent with your work, and then it's just there. Um, technically, there's a Vim plugin somewhere for it if you really wanted to. All right. You, you can most definitely run it up to CI/CD, um, because really, no matter whose CI/CD you're using, they all can effectively run a shell script, which this will do. Um, I do actually recommend that people consider that when they're starting to do refinements or in, in long-term projects. If you're fixing up your shell code, you should be fixing up your Docker files, right? So that was a good point. I didn't think to mention that one. Do we use it in all of our images? No. Do we do it in a number of our repositories? Oh, yes. Yes, yes. All linters can be both helpful and cumbersome, to say the least, especially if you're listening to every single warning as a failure. Um, that works great when you're upgrading the version of C that you're trying to compile your application to. Just, you know, you've got to read them all eventually and not get caught up in the wrong things. All right. What's next on our... Okay. Stop. Scopio. Right, so I'm going to shrink the text size a hair because I need to output a lot of text. <laughs> Do I have YQ? No. JQ? Okay, good. I at least installed one thing I actually needed. Now, Now that we've got that, now we can make the size bigger. Here's the thing. If you want to know what an actual Docker container looks like under the hood, everything is described by this junk. What its ID is, what its digest is, it has a certain amount of metadata that tells you what built it, when it was made, and a little bit of configuration. Remember we talked about Environment variables versus args. You're only going to get so much in here. This is the thing that you're all going to care about when it comes to size. Right? No. That's actually your file system behaviors. Your root of s, these are your layers. Each one of these is a layer. Now, Docker Inspect won't tell you this tidbit of information remotely. You have to pull the image, then run that, then it'll tell you this. So, looks simple, right? Now, most people are using overlay two. You could be using overlay two, you could be using dev mapper, you could be using AUFS, AUFS two, any stacking file system, this is basically what this does. If you wanted to go poke around in a container as somebody who had root access to a machine, you'd be surprised what you can make a machine do if you have access to its file system when it's operating. Same thing works with a container. So we've taken a real quick look at what Docker and spec looks like. Here's my ID. Here's what the tag is that I'm supposed to have. Here is 
what my particular digest is when I was made. Now, if I do the same thing, but do it with Scopio, and I have to prefix the repository it's going to query, so I have to say Dr. Colin. Now I get much more direct information. Hmm. That's a lot more tags than just latest, right? This is what the, the registry actually has in it. When I ask for latest, it's going to tell me all the tags that are related to it, the digest according to the latest one. It's the manifest, SHA-2. Here's our three layers and what their SHAs are. Now, what you'll see is there's your SHA. That's a layer that matches that. There's your SHA matches, right? These three file systems together are compressed sizes. And then you still get the rest of the metadata information. I had a hand come up. Did that pull it from the image that was already there, or did it have to talk to the repo to get So when I did this command, Scopio actually, because I said Docker, it actually reached out to the registry and said, hey, API, give me this information. Correct, because images don't contain tags. Tags, by the way, you notice that I'm, I was inspecting the latest tag on the image? Don't use that in production, ever. I'll get to that one in a minute. But no, this one in particular actually inspected the remote repository. If I do Docker, uh, I forgot that it. No. I have forgotten the syntax. Or did I spell it wrong? I don't know which one. I spelled it wrong. Effectively, you can ask the daemon itself, so the CRI that you're using, or the repository of choice. Uh, there's multiple syntaxes for this one in particular. Scopio, I wanted to bring this one up because people don't realize that if they just ask the registry, they can get a whole lot of information back. In particular, if you do this JQ and you do dot repo tags, you can just find out what actual versions are still available. Do, do you want to know whether there's a new version of your container available? One line command. And, yeah, yeah, well, to say the least, you can, that data can be extremely large, right? Um, and going to the website to find that out, you have to manually do it. That's probably about six to seven clicks plus load time. This is one query. So this trade-off. But, but then you can also do it programmatically because you can handle the JSON or, and it does support other formats for output. So Scopio in particular I like because if I do the same thing and I actually get a touch more information, so give me the raw output. Now I'm going to be looking actually raw at the manifest data rather than what's the information about this. It's going to actually go, hey, this is the tag I want. Tell me what this, this is. If you know what git is, then you know that a tag is just a pointer. A tag on an image is just a manifest that has a name. It doesn't mean anything. That's what latest actually resolves to. So if you have a single arch image, like this one apparently is, you'll have the version of the schema, what kind it is, and it says, I'm a manifest, I'm an image, here's the layers of my image. The client, so the Docker daemon, will actually go out, grab those bits, pull them down, and that's when it says I'm pulling the layers, it's going and pulling those things. If you have a multi-architecture image, this looks even different, because then you have a manifest of manifests, and then those manifests 
have things in them. So if I do reasonable image out there that somebody knows as multiple architectures. Seems like a lot more information there, huh? Because now this is every version and every image it's built on. So when you say that, it's going to tell you where it was built, when it was built, and all this information. Here's ARM 32 V7. Hey, look, Pi 2's work. The amount of information that's in the API, this is the underlying thing. It's just it's a giant index store. It's there, it's present. And whether you're going to use it as a consumer or you're going to use it to build, the information is just floating there if you know where to look and why to look. Underlying, in the end, Building containers, you don't have to know any of this stuff. But this is under the hood what it cares about. Okay. Now, speaking of Docker Compose. This is a copy of the Docker Compose from our repository. It's 245 lines. Now, there's a lot of services in here. Anybody familiar with Docker Compose? Okay. Half the room is familiar with Docker Compose. Who here knows what it is but not what it does? One hand, two hands. Okay. The TLDR on this one is, remember we talked about trying to wire up a bunch of services? Docker Compose gives you a way to manage all of your items of work into a workload. So you have Postgres and Redis, and I have a migrations container here on screen. The migrations container is my application code that's going to make sure that my database is up, configured, and at the state that my application needs it. Does my application itself need to know that migrations existed. It just needs to start, and the database needs to be there for it to start, right? It needs to know about Postgres and Redis. It doesn't need to care about migrations. But I can tell it don't start until that's done. Services in Docker Compose tells you these are the containers and the names they're going to operate, and then you tell it Here's the image I'm going to use. Here's my environment. Here's any other things I need, whether it's which network I'm attached to or what my hosts are, whether I should be overriding my host name. It also allows you to say, I have to have, like depends. These are the simplistic ways of setting your dependencies. I literally can't do my job unless the database and the, the cache server are online, so please make sure they're online first. This is Docker Compose solving that problem so that if you're trying to run these by hand, you're like, okay, I need to start this container, but let me go make sure those are happy first. Docker Compose will do that level of automation for you. Go way down. You can also define volumes in a programmatic way, right? Instead of actually having to preemptively make your directory store and stick things into it, you can say, when I'm running a DB upgrade, I need tempfs to work in. Give it this much, and then you can refer to it later as, please give me the disk named DB upgrade. Or uploads. I'm still using tempfs here. Right, so the host has a tempfs volume that it's made, but now I can refer to uploads because I have two containers that have to share a directory to pass processed upload to entity that will process the upload. Right? So I can define all of these things ahead of time, and I can have them supplied by various drivers and various options. Almost all of this, in this case, is tempfs. Because this is a spin it up, make sure it works. Okay, MR ought to pass. 
you can do things like saying, I want these three on this network, this one to talk on the host network, and align these things, but that's getting deeper into the complexity of what's going on. This is not a production definition. This is our like literal dev test, spawn, check, shut it off. Sadly, this is where a whole bunch of slides were supposed to be. I am bummed by loss of slides. Anyways, um, I don't know that, that for the crowd that seems to be here based on the nods I've gotten earlier, that sitting here and actually walking through building a container is gonna do you a lot of good. I can, however, give you the very simple example of this is a one layer container, or this is a one stage container, and this is a multi-stage container by literally walking through that if you'd want. Okay. Wow, keyboard. We'll go with the slim image. Effectively, what you would be dealing with is any time that you want to go building things or leaving in documentation or symbols or things like this, you have your base layer that things are coming from. In this case, we just literally just pick one randomly. We're going to do this inefficiently. Really inefficiently. or we feel like installing. Go, all of dev tools. Actually, you know what? I don't remember the Debian package name for all of dev tools. Does anybody? Build essentials sounds right. Okay. Remember to thank Zach for having very good internet and Wi-Fi here. Mm. Package name? Work. Cool. Okay, so here's the thing. If I skipped all of this, right? If I just built this, how big do you think that image actually ends up being? Like I just literally downloaded it. And it totals it would be how much? It's 
going to get 103 megs of archives, 401 on disk. If you don't clean that up, all of that sits on the system. If I do run apt remove, in the next layer, it's going to go and take that back out. But for at least the time you're doing this, you've got a layer that's 400. If I take it back out, it's not there in the final image. Is it? We talked about this earlier, right? If it's in there, it's in there. Right, if it's in the layer, it's in the image. The question is whether or not the application at that time sees it because of the way AUFS or overlay, the stacking drivers work. It doesn't seem offensive because your runtime looks secure or looks small, but you had to sh ship 400 megs to a user for them to run a 5K binary? Seems like a problem, right? So just to be able to example this, we're going to save that. We're going to go ahead and build that. Am I not in a... We'll let that run, and then we'll look at this container and dive, just to show you it's still there. And it's actually problematic because I didn't use the command correctly. What did it just tell me? Oh. Yeah, because I forgot the argument. See, it's not the hardware problems I'm having today, it's the mental problems of not having my slides. Can't even remember how to type a command correctly. I could have also, I guess, set the environment for non-interactive. Right. Dive on the output. Oops. Did I still ship somebody 400 megs? Yep, and it's still there. Didn't go anywhere. That is dive. Like from here, it's dive. For what I'm seeing right now in the output, that's just Docker inspect. Is there a Docker inspect flag that will give me more details on the file layers? I'm so accustomed at this point to. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Tech ass. There it is. Total size 452, right? Redo the same process. How, how big do you think that sucker's going to end up being? I did touch files. Yep. 
so in thinking about efficiency from your perspective, trying to kind of crack my head around the value other than it gets, um, or I kind of understand the context between why. Is it shipping unnecessary data across the wire from a networking perspective? Is it storage? Is it kind of um, like reducing some of the toll or like feedback loops for developers actually working with these images? So it comes down to operational costs. OpEx is a thing, right? So oh, I forgot the why again. The layers in your image are stored on the developer's machine or in your CI machine. Anytime you're doing that, it's an operational cost because if it takes a snapshot, there's actual processing time in making that snapshot for the layer. That's, that's one aspect. So you're looking at execution time. The next thing is if you store it, even though it's compressed, you've got it stored there and it's going to be there until the cache is cleared on that daemon. It's then going to be shipped across the network and then it's going to be stored. How long is that going to be stored for? Why should it be stored for that long? Do you have control over that, right? So shipping 400 extra megs, even if it compresses down to 200, you're now storing 200 for you don't know how long. And every time somebody consumes the image that has that layer, they're pulling 200, so you're paying to ship that over the wire again. So every time you ship an inefficient image, and when I say ship, I mean consumed by your systems or an, an end user outside of your systems, you're paying the network cost and the storage cost. You already have it, and then you're shipping it, you're paying the egress. And if it's your system, you are then proceeding to have several hundred megs that has to be pulled over the wire. And not every runtime will pull images and layers in an asynchronous fashion. They will actually serialize it in some of them. And the bigger the image, the more layers it has, the longer it takes to be able to do any work. And effectively, now you're, you're compounding storage and transit and time all together. So the image efficiency, the actions to do that do complicate the workload of the developer or the person creating the container, but they simplify and significantly impact the bottom line of how to actually operationalize these things for you or customers. All right. One point four megs instead of four hundred and fifty. It's a little bit of a difference. I didn't remember I didn't remove the lists files. So how lint would yell at me because I didn't remove things after I installed or removed packages. That's actually what most of that size is. It's just those files. But that's why you take junk out of your layers or never have it in your layers in the first place. Because that's the 400 megs you didn't need to ship, even if you thought you got rid of it. And yes, there are t tactics that you can use. Uh, should have this in the slides, and I'll bet you it's the one that f disappeared. Slim. If you're making simple containers, and I say simple containers, Slim Toolkit and Docker Slim, what's now just called Slim, actually can do a significant portion of automated dependency detection for you. Run your build, do a smoke test if your application actually touches all of the files it needs at boot slash a simple set of commands to get it to actually exercise these. It can actually trace down those dependencies, log what those are for you, and then take everything out that doesn't need to be there. So it can actually shortcut a lot of that for a lot of people. Um, the build will do all of that and generate security policies related to it. X-Ray is very useful for information about what's functioning inside of that, but this tool is 
very useful. It is not a replacement for good design. It's useful to optimize at least decent design. Got to remember to put that into these slides again before I post them for the fellow in the back that asks for them. There's nothing else in these slides and I'm not sure which is the next part you want me to go through. I feel bad. <laughs> All right, well, we're about an hour through that section. Uh, does anybody need a quick break? Cool, give it, uh, we'll give it the top of the hour.
Test, test.
All right. Okay. So we have effectively two real sections to get through at this point um, and about the hour to do so. There's this section here that is effectively a deep dive on what containers actually are and the way they work under the hood. We've covered poorly in the last section container, the layers, and some efficiency stuff. I want to explain how the containers actually function within Linux. Docker or Kubernetes, they're all operating on the concepts below what con containers are. We'll cover most of the hows, but really the what's and the whys. And then we'll sneak in a little bit and explain some of the object patterns, the, the conceptual patterns of how these things still apply when you're looking at it from Kubernetes. Because remember, it defaults to a different runtime than Docker for most distributions. And namespaces are very interesting in the way they're expressed because they behave a little different than when you're just running a container by hand. So, in the end, what really is containers? If, if you think a container is Docker, you've got it backwards. They are three primary things, which is isolation and control and the way to package something. The way that we consume them as a Docker container or a container at all, it's just packaging. How we use them then is all about the isolation and the controls. So Rich is here, but not in the room. He and I, quite a few years ago now, uh, gave a presentation that actually explained in strong detail what exactly containers are. Now, these slides I'm going to skip in chunk, and I can link these slides because these ones are public already. Effectively, what's going on and the way that we approach things. It all comes down to namespaces and C groups. So who's familiar with what, na what a namespace actually is? Like actually, what is a namespace? You, you might have used it in Kubernetes and you've heard what a namespace is and it isolates a group of resources. Well, they're reusing the same term because the term is a concept. When it comes to how does it actually work, it's all about partitioning resources within the kernel itself. You can have a Docker container that has Docker in it that runs a container, and which process can see the host? The short answer is none of them but the host processes, right? The only way you can manage to do this is if you can segregate those things off, because now your new namespace can say, oh, I'm PID1, even though it's not. So let's try and look at what that actually means. If you have the parent, right, and even on your, your Linux computer, you have a namespace at all times, which is the root of the context that your operating system is in, right? PID1's namespace, which for a lot of distributions now, like it or not, it's systemd. You have all of the processes involved there. You can then have each one of those also have their own nam namespace where they can't see things. You can then have breakdowns inside of those because they just keep working even down the turtles. In the end, namespaces of all forms, process, mount, uh, your storage, you can do some really interesting things to say the least. There for segregation and isolation of your resources so that you can have two applications run side by side and never know they exist. It also works strictly for a containering, it, as we want to put it that way, but it also works if you're doing process isolation for security purposes in highly controlled environments. But you don't need containers to do that. They're just a handy tool for it. 
we extra abstract and simplify all these things so that you no longer have to manually figure out how to do this stuff. And it works for everything. You can do it for IPC, just IPC. You can do it for the network. You can have virtual interfaces. As a matter of fact, most container runtimes and their CNIs just handle that part for you. But you can also do it for all of your mounts, your processes, and inside of your containers, you can have them run namespaces that then have further namespaces under them. That's how you run Docker and Docker, by the way. Did you know you can namespace your users? People didn't even know that one. That's the last, what, five or six years now that's been in the kernel, you could do that? So after namespaces, we get into C groups or our control groups. This is another feature within the kernel built in that allows for limitations and controls across all of the resources that the kernel can manage. This is an addition to namespaces. So you can have a namespace that has multiple processes in it and then actually have control groups on those processes or those resources. For example, if you want a user to be able to run whatever he pro program he wants, but he's never allowed to use more than so much disk, you can enforce a quota with C groups. If you want to make sure that you have a 32 gig system and you've got multiple users on it and some guy really likes to run a Node.js script that eats 17 gigs for no reason and you're tired of having your web server die, you can make sure that that person never ever gets more than 16 gigs from the kernel, even if it has 40 gigs free. C groups can do this so this gives you the segregation controls. The namespaces give you the isolation controls. Like I said, you can do this for resource limits, but you can also effectively enforce niceness across an entire user or an entire PID space. You can use it for accounting in many ways so that you're actually watching all of these pieces of information. And under the hood, Kubernetes is actually doing that because these are built-in objects that they're just building on top of. Then, of course, controlling. What if you actually wanted something to just stop doing anything so you could coalesce a snapshot? What if you just told the kernel, hey, can you just, like, pause that? Do your snapshot? Okay, let go. You can actually do that. And it's built in, it's just hard to use. So if we try to visualize this for a second, we look at it from a C group, and we've got our four aspects that we're gonna care about. Our IO, our storage, right? Our network, CPU, memory. Well, if we cut those pieces off and we say we have a dedicated section that just goes to that one group, the rest of the system has those parts, right? You can then further slice those things up if you really wanted to, but does this remind us of anything? This looks like VMs, doesn't it? If you think about it, all we're doing with VMs on a, on a host is slicing up the CPU and memory. Can you over-provision a virtual machine host? You certainly can. Can you over-provision C groups and memory handlers? Yeah, you can do that too. Maybe you don't want to, but you know, the neckbeard SREs know why. <laughs> The rest of us have found out the hard way. You can, and this is what's actually happening under the hood when you're using containers or Kubernetes or other words that effectively hide magic. We're just doing this. This is a, a well, it's a cartoon I found that made a lot of sense. And it explains some of the behavior patterns of what the C groups do. If you're looking at memory, you can basically say, I want 10 gigs, I want 10 gigs, and you've only got, whoops, you've only got 16. You can't fill both, right? Well, what happens when you run out of memory? Do you choke a process out? Does the kernel randomly pick a process to kill? If you have C groups, you can volunteer certain things to go first. You can say, I, you know what? No JS guy, you can have eight gigs, but you need to keep it. That's it. 
they will get allocated 8.1 gigs for a split second and the kernel will go bad and the hammer will come down. If you have CPU and you're familiar with this, if you've done noisy neighbors in virtual machines, right? You can have many things competing for the CPU cycles. C groups can throttle that resource because you can control how much time it has. Memory doesn't work like that, so if you go over the CPU, you're not going to get the hammer. You're going to get throttled or cut back on how many cycles you can get through the kernel processing. But with the memory, it doesn't really have a choice. You can tell it you're not allowed to have more memory, and then when it tries again, thunk. So the question in the back is, could you, could you have it instead return a nil pointer so that it would be able to handle that scenario? Your application then has to be aware of its environment and know what that signal is supposed to mean. The answer is yes, it can be done. But it's not something that people are doing on a regular basis. And I wish more people did. Like, no, if they asked for more memory and got effectively told no, then stop trying. Um, but I can name a certain number of uh, browsers that don't like that, <laughs> as an example, uh, that people spend most of their time in. So is it technically possible? Yes. Is that going to work for the mainstay of all applications? Probably not. It's a practicality concern. Okay. Well-formed, the mic needed to be there for that. And the third thing is, that is way further in the detail weeds than I want to be right now. So I apologize. <laughs> Again, you're not wrong that the browser could respond by dropping cache, right? But we're talking about theoreticals on systems that are overtly complex as it is on behaviors that we then have to start enforcing on the environment that they are in so that they know to respond. So academically, it's not a bad practice. Practically, it's going to take some work before the ecosystem is prepared for that. And it's farther into the weeds than we want to go. OK? All right. So and when we look at that, then right, we have the various aspects that they actually have in the image. What, happens, what do you do when you've got too much memory being consumed? And what are your limits? What are your CPUs for slowdowns? In the end, C groups are just controlling your access to those things and the behavior that occurs to those. And the last thing they do is control your priority of the access to those things. So we've got namespaces that basically control isolation, C groups that then control further on the segregation and the separation. And then we've got packaging, which is how do you actually send these things around? which is to some degree what we were talking about in the last section. The things that people are going to care about are impotency, guaranteed, and verifiable. Now, if anybody's worked in the security space recently, they know just how annoying that last one is. So it's, it's file systems. Right? We got layers of fire file systems and they're being stacked together. AFS or AFS2, overlay FS, which is what most people are using by default, um, and DevMapper are 
one of those. Now, there are big details in how these layered file systems work under the hood, but what matters is these are three methods that are most common that I've seen, overlay being the default for a lot of folks. The way in which you're using these drivers affects the way the tarballs are generated because they see files being touched differently, way under the hood. So the last thing is how do you actually transport? One way or another, it's tarballs 95% of the time. You can do, like I said, literally squash FS images, and then they stack them that way. But yeah, really, almost always, it's some form of tarball, almost always compressed. Recently, I'm seeing a lot of people actually compressing with tar or XZ instead of uh, Z, uh, gzip. And recently, I've seen some platforms start to properly configure for Z standard. Um, Trade-offs there. We already did an example earlier with the whole layer behaviors. Now, verification, here's the fun one. How do you know that what you asked for is what you got? Like, that's what you're going to want to care about, is like, if I ask for this, will I always get the same container? Will I always have a way to guarantee it? And will I be able to verify that that guarantee is held true? Verification, we all know tar tarballs, and we can make checksums on tarballs, right? Do you download your ISOs or install something from the internet without at least checking that its checksum is correct, or that it's, if it's been signed. All of these things can be done if we're just shipping these same types of behaviors around. But, and this is why I was pointing out that we were talking earlier about the layers and the ordering that, that they were in. The, oh, look, there's a manifest, this is a layer that has this checksum, and then you go to layers, and here's this one, here's this one, and this one, in order. Because you can have 40 layers. If you don't put them together in the right order, you don't know what you're going to get out the other side. Of course, the sheer answer is we deal with the order of the stack. Now, the Docker's manifest tell you this. So again, they're getting this out of the way for you. But if you were to do this yourself, you can very literally take your host file system, mount an AUFS, writable root over the top of that, and then perform operations. And then when you unmount that AUFS, your system's back to normal. You did nothing to it. It looks like you did things so long as that AUFS is mounted and you're operating within that mount. As long as you're in that mount namespace, everything looks like it. But as soon as you're outside of it, it has no idea what you did because it's not in that file system. It's in the layer above it. All we're doing with containers is taking those layers that have had those additive behaviors, or in some cases, subtractive behaviors, like uninstalling apt. All you're doing is, this is my order, this is my stack, put them here, and then it should run the way I said. That's where the impotency comes in and the guarantee of what I got comes from, is here's the things, here's the order, do them this way, now please run them. So from that, you take the three pieces that you have, the namespacing, the control groups, and the file systems for packaging. Then you actually have what a container actually is. No matter how you want to call it one, whether it's a Docker container, it's a run C, it's an LXC, those are everything you need to know about how a container actually functions. Uh, is anybody familiar with nspawn? No? So, here's a fun little tool. Did you know that you can have an Arch desktop with a container that has Ubuntu, that has a container inside of it that has Fedora and run all three desktops at once on the same hardware? Look into nspawn. You want to you geek out and toy on things? Take the container unpack it into a tarball in the file system, and then tell it to switch namespaces and boot that. You will end up with Ubuntu on TTY1, Fedora on TTY2, 
whatever your host is on TTY7. And when you do control alt F2, F1, you'll be jumping between OSs. <laughs> That's technically containerized operating systems. Technically. But it's built into every system that has systemd. You just have to go look and figure out what an end spawn is. Here's a hint. What's the N probably stand for? Correct. The namespaces. <laughs> you can actually use those namespace separation and isolation to have full systems underneath. Yes, that's all of that. Now, I do have further links and I can explain in detail how all of these things actually function. I do have my other slides from Rich, um, which clearly I, I want to thank him every time I have to talk about namespaces because his research helped me a lot. There are exercises that are present that actually give us full demos of actually detaching processes from the active namespace. If you get the slides from the presentation that are linked here and go through these, I apologize to the stream, I will have them available later. You can get a hands-on exercise on how to go through actually unsharing, separating basically your processes and your file systems individually. Uh, and this actually has a demo of having an art system and then bootstrapping and then bootstrapping another OS and just jumping into the next one. So there's some interesting play things here. All right. So now that we understand underlying or to some degree underlying what's actually going on, right? how the containers function, how many people here have actually done Kubernetes deployments. I, I've got a, got a half a shake, a half a shake here. Okay, so you've played with them at least, but not necessarily actually done. Okay. Get rid of that. So remember when I said that the they have children's books? <laughs> I'm going to snag these. They are they're freely available and in PDFs. You can, I got them directly from the CNCF's website. What I want to explain is what workloads are. Remember I, I spoke earlier about a workload and Docker Compose being services are parts of the workload. Okay, so let's start with the base thing that people care about. Is that we're going to talk about what a pod is, but a pod is just a way to describe an instance of a workload. Okay, so if you were to have Docker Compose and have that file and it has services and here's my storage and here's my network and here is this container with this configuration and these mounts, a pod effectively defines the same thing. But you can have one pod that has multiple replicas. So you can have three servers all running Docker Compose that all behave the same way effectively, right? So if you have, say, a container like I do, we have a service that we call web service. I know, creative name, but it, the web server had different names, so we got tired of renaming the container. So we're just like, look, that one serves the web. It's web service, right? It actually has two containers in it. It has one that is the actual primary Rails application that actually does all the API work, and it actually has a smart shim proxy that offloads all of the, the heavy but I.O. heavy things to a Go shim that runs in front of it. So we have a container here and a container here. All of the traffic comes in through one and to the next one. That way Rails isn't spending its time handling somebody doing an upload. We could let Golang and its anonymous functions handle that. Tool for job. But now I have to describe if I want to be able to make many copies of my web server and the API server behind it, how do I do that? Here's my containers, one and two, 
all traffic, I can say this one exposes no ports and this one exposes one port. All traffic goes here. Now, I then give them everything they need to know for those containers. Where's my mounts? Where do I get my passwords from? All these things are described in the pod. Now I've described a full instance of a workload, right? Now if I want to make a hundred of these things, how do I direct traffic? Well, first off, I got to figure out how to make a hundred of these things. If I describe a workload that is a pod, I can use a deployment that contains the description of the workload that is a pod. That will then manage my replicas for me. If I say, I want you to have 10 of these, it will always make sure this thing says it wants 10. Please make sure I have 10. And it will ask the API anytime that number doesn't agree. And then now, if I want to have 50 of them, because say somebody bought GitHub, I can just be like, okay, I need you to give me five times as much. And Kubernetes would be like, oh, okay, give me a minute. And start spawning all of the new instances for me. Now that I have 10 or 50, now I need a way to actually get traffic in. Well, this is a simplistic diagram. But effectively, I need an endpoint that all traffic goes to, and then I need it to go to the number of pods I have behind it. They speak of ingresses in the next slide, but this is a good demonstration of what a service is. A service is literally just a name that provides you a network proxy so that you have one resolvable address that actually refers to all of the pods behind it. So you can have 50 or 100 pods or one in a service that doesn't actually contain stateful data. You can have however many copies you want. You don't want to have to have every client of that know where every single pod is and round robin try ones and, until it gets an answer, right? Services are implemented in the network stack, in the CNI, okay? You have one name and one address. The traffic will come in and it will be routed to something that matches the criteria. So that's the glaziest I can get on that. Ingresses is something that you'll hear a lot. Ingresses provide a means for traffic into the cluster. An ingress sits in front of a service and provides literally ingress to your clusters. So you have a web server as an example, or a WebSockets server of some kind. You have an address somewhere on the internet that provides a load balancer that then points at this ingress. And the ingress just describes, when this address gets hit, please send it there. Or for example, if you've run complex web servers before, if you do slash images, you always want it to go to the fleet of things that are spending their entire day just serving images. They don't need any CPU time, they just need to know where to send the images from, right? But if you hit slash API, well, that needs to go to the fleet of APIs that we just talked about. So the ingress can actually divide up where the traffic is going. So you have one income, or one incoming point and many outgoing points, and those ingresses will be, okay, this traffic, by definition, goes to this service, which then you don't have to care about because it's taking care of it for you, which goes to one of these many, many pods. So a pod is the base object. This is what I'm doing. It's a workload description. A deployment tells you this is how many I want, and here's my description of what the thing is that I want. A service provides access to all of the things that it creates, and then an ingress provides access to the outside to a service. So think of it as your port forwarding on your firewall. Now I've kept talking about stateful data. You've heard me say this a few times. They don't 
happen to have that in here. So why don't we cover... It's cute, but it works. Why don't we take a look at like what actually happens. When I say a deployment will ask the API to make sure it always has enough. Here's a good example. Right, you've got the four pillars. You, I want to have four replicas at all time. Well, if you need to rotate a node or Johnny there has to go take a restroom break, you still need to have four of them online. Like you still have to have the four people at the counter taking orders, right? Johnny needs his break, call Sarah from the back. Kubernetes API basically goes, huh, one of them's going away. I need to make another one. And it will find somewhere to stand another one up so that you always have those four. That's the way the, the replicas controller ensures that when you say I want four of these, that I always have four of this description running and engaged. Do they touch it at all? No, they don't touch stateful sets here. In Kubernetes, there's another object, because I've, I've said it multiple times, and I will continue to say it many, many times when it comes to how things function. Your stateful data does not go in your deployments, because those pods will scale up and down, and they will go away, and their disks will not exist. You don't want to lose data. Stateful data are as described. Stateful data. They look like a deployment. The difference is every replica that they make will actually make a numbered replica. And if you destroy one of those replicas, it will make a new copy of that replica. But it will get the same disk. So you will always have my database dash zero. Say I want four replicas, you'll have my database zero, one, two, and three. And zero will always get zero's disk, and four will always get four's disk, and they will never get confused. That said, if you write to tempfs in that container, bye, don't do that. You can do file servers inside of Kubernetes. You can do database servers inside of Kubernetes. You need to keep in mind, these are not file servers that have a disk that makes it hard to use. It will handle that for you, but you need to remember that your workloads can blip out and they will come back, but they won't always be in the same place. A particular case that I've seen that people have made a bad mistake on just because you can have multi-zonal resiliency does not mean your disks will migrate across zones. But it does multi-zone, that's great. But if you're in US East zone one and your Postgres server goes, oh, all of US East went away, guess what? Your Postgres server is not coming up because the disk is over there. You can use stateful data. You have to remember where the data lives, and you have to remember that if you're limited by how fast you can get the data from one place to another, that's how long it's going to take for that service to come up in the other place. Versus if you have a zonal resiliency for applications that don't actually store data, just access it, like an API, API server, you can have one in all of the zones. And now you're going to have to know that if your database server is in zone one and your application is in zone three, that the API server in zone one is going to respond faster all the time than the one that's in zone three, because now you have network transit. The nice thing about when you're running Docker yourself, running containers yourself, if they're on your machine, they have direct access to the disk. They probably have near instant access to your data services that are running on the same machine. If you're using Docker Compose, your Postgres instance is milliseconds away. And I, when I say milliseconds, I mean like sub millisecond response times. The ape, it may not re respond to your query that fast. If it does, nice. Two, the connection will form, okay? 
and then the time it takes to transfer the data will be extremely low. If you have two VMs in different racks, you've added latency. If you've got two VMs in different data centers, you've added more latency. There's nothing you can do about that. Kubernetes tries to not obfuscate this from you. It tries to help you with it and make it less complicated for you to deploy, but it's still affected by the same environment variables that you've always had with VMs. So whether it's your memory constraints or anything else, these are things you have to care about. Doesn't matter if it's magic that's making it actually stand up, you're still gonna be dealing with that problem. The thing I wanna point out, because we've talked about C groups, we've talked about namespaces, and we've talked about packaging. C groups in Kubernetes, these are resources. You define what your workload is by saying, resources, I want to have a minimum of this much memory this much CPU, those work by default, but there's plugins that allow you for, I want this many GPUs and this much disk. And you can say, I also want a maximum of this and this. If you say, I don't need any memory, but I'm allowed to use up to two gigs, it will literally go, okay, well, I've got five megs over there. How much you wanna bet that uh, Node.js script needs more than five megs just to load, okay? It got, it, it said it didn't need any memory. Okay. That's best effort. It's gonna try. If you say, I know that this script usually needs two gigs, sometimes a little bit more, and it's mission critical that it runs. What do you do? Do you hope and pray? Or do you say, I want 2.5 gigs and I'm allowed to use 2.5 gigs? If you do that, if you set the the requirements and the maxes or the limits, now you get guaranteed. Now you will be given two CPUs and 2.5 gigs of RAM, and it will make sure that when you want to use more CPU, until you're using two whole CPUs, it won't slow you down. And the moment that you ask for 2.4 gigs, it will go, I already have them for you. Right. As we're as we're nearing the end of our time, that's a great question. Is is there a way to define on the pods prioritization so that if you have a lower priority pod, it will be evicted to make room for a more critical pod? The answer is yes, but it's complicated. <laughs> Um, the short answer is there is actually priority classing. So in the last uh, year and a half, they standardized priority class. And you can actually define what the attributes are for the priority class. Um, there are pre-existing ones for super high priority. Don't mess with those unless you have to uh, because you can override system level pods. <laughs> you, you don't wanna do that, right? Like, watch me kill the thing that manages this node uh-oh. Um, and by the way, yes, I've seen that happen. Um, just like I've seen pods go, yeah, no, d four gigs should be enough. Split second job comes in and it goes from 3.9 gigs to 8.5. Guess who lost? There was no definition of who should have a limit, so the kernel out of memory killed the node controller. <laughs> and we're like, ooh. That's why it keeps going offline. What are they doing? <laughs> right, we learned we absolutely have to know what our application's expectations are. We absolutely have to know what the priorities are. Don't stomp on things you shouldn't be stomping on and know if you normally need 100 megs, ask for 100 megs. If you sometimes burst up to 500 megs, tell it. <laughs> if it's mission critical, consider your minimums and limits to make sure they fit. Know your workloads, basically, when it comes down to it. Like the database, you, you, if you've got five gigs of data in your database, and a lot of it's just sitting in cache 95% of the time, you can pressure that down with memory controls. 
but maybe it's a mission critical database and the milliseconds it spends reading it from disk again is worth it to give it a little more memory if you have it. It depends. There's no prescriptive for everything. You have to just know how it works for your own code. All right, I pretty much just slammed a whole bunch of stuff in there. We have literally moments for another question if anybody wants one. Okay, nobody? Then thanks for coming, and I apologize for some uh, slide and content issues. Uh, if you have any further questions, I can answer lots of interesting in-depth questions without a problem, just not as part of this. So. See me later. Thank you.